So, Martin, welcome to Hong Kong. Well, it's wonderful to be back. Such a vibrant city uh, and an amazing energy. I'm 78, and I feel when I'm in Hong Kong, I might be 50. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Kevin Huang, the Chief Operating Officer of the South China Morning Post. Please welcome the legendary Sir Martin Sorrell, a pioneering force in the advertising industry, a titan, a visionary, founder and executive chairman of S4 Capital, the digital marketing powerhouse behind the brand Media Monks. His pioneering strategies and relentless drive have shaped the media industry for decades. Today, we'll delve into his remarkable journey, insights, and predictions for 2024 for the advertising world. Sir Martin, welcome to the South Lovely China to be back Post. again. Thank you for joining uh, us today. Legendary in his own mind. <laughs> Delighted to be back. It's been too long. I know we mentioned it's your first 24 hours in the city, but <laughs> can you give me your first impression about Hong Kong? Well, it, it has tremendous energy. I, I'm coming from the airport early in the morning. No traffic, I'm glad to say. And I got a good view of the of the city. It's as vibrant as ever. I think one of the, one of the issues is that the perception of Hong Kong and the, the reality may be two different things. And, and as we know, the perception is the reality. And to change the perception, as you well know, Kevin, is uh, we, we need better communications. Uh, what's needed is really to try and adjust what people think Hong Kong is uh, as to what it actually is. I think the interesting thing about the visit is it emphasizes once again, the importance of Hong Kong mm. and the determination. I think there's a tendency externally to write it off mm. or to denigrate it. And I think that's wrong because I think uh, the, the city has immense resources, financial resources, startup resources, talent resources, uh, and an amazing energy. I'm 78. And I feel when I'm in Hong Kong, I might be 50. <laughs> we, we, we certainly welcome you to Hong Kong well, more I'm often. Well, delightful to be back. You've been in the marketing and communications industry Too for long. decades. Yeah. Uh, I'll get into that. <laughs> um, but what advice would you give the Hong Kong government or even the Hong Kong residents about correcting that misperception about what the city is in the eyes of other people? Well, it needs communication. Um, you know, a lot of things worldwide currently, because the world is a bit of a crazy place in many respects. When the world is in turmoil, communication is really important, you know, communication between governments, between administrations. So I think the, the lesson from that is that the government really has to focus on building the perception uh, of Hong Kong in a different way on a global basis, because there is a gap between yes. the perception and the reality, and that has to be closed. Do you think that in communications, and you've, you've stated that you know governments don't tend to always do the best job, do you think that a private sector plus government partnership might be a way forward for Hong Kong? It could be. I mean, at the end of the day, vision plays an important part of it. So it needs a very deep uh, administrative effort and leadership to, to get it done. Now, maybe Hong Kong is uh, obviously in the context of mainland China, etc., is probably a little bit different. But I, I think vision is really important mm. and then implementation. It has to be um, ruthlessly um, um, implemented. In other words, there has to be an agreed vision and then ministries have to keep to that executing and, and, and the exec private execute sector it and extremely effectively. Sure. I want to jump back into um, advertising, marketing, sure. and technology. Um, you know, obviously, the world's a very different place from five years ago. Mm -hmm. um, in, in your point of view, what role do you think the Hong Kong marketing industry can play in the context of the Greater Bay Area? You touched on, you know, Shenzhen and you know. The, the, and the likes of it, and southern China. But you know, Hong Kong obviously has a very special place in all of our hearts. Uh, but also, there are some uniqueness. Do you think it can contribute to the wider region, and in particular, oh, the GBA yeah. area? There's no doubt it can. But I mean, in the context, and, and I think now Hong Kong plays a much broader role than it did historically in the context of China. And it's a very much more balanced relationship. I mean, uh, I think the perception could be improved globally. So the last 40 or 50 years have been a golden era mm. of uh, no tariffs, world trade, um, reducing barriers. Yeah. Now barriers are being inserted with those geo 
political yep. problems that I mentioned. So it's much more difficult. Now, what does that mean for somebody who's trying to run a mini global any business yeah. or, or any global business? I think two things, really. The first is that you have to take a much more selective approach as to where you will expand your business. Okay. To my mind, the growth, the growth spots in the world are going to be North and South America. They mm -hmm. are and will be North and South America. Mm -hmm. Tremendous creative and technological talent in South America, in Mexico, in Colombia, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Uruguay, to pick out five, five markets. That's one thing. Africa, a lot of promise population-wise and opportunity-wise, but a lot of volatility. Middle East, despite the, the current issues there, I think the Saudi vision is so powerful uh, and will be implemented effectively. That's obviously a, a growth spot. And then Asia. Mm. Uh, obviously, China you know, dominates Asia. If you look at 2050 and the projections for GDP growth, China would be the largest economy. The US second, India third, mm. Indonesia fourth, and Germany five. And that means that three of the top five, you know, the Premier League, if we yeah. can use that analogy, will be Asian countries. So Asia is pivotal. I mean, China is about 18 trillion in terms of GDP out of 100 for the mm -hmm. world. US is 28. Mm -hmm. So you need about 20% of your business, at least in theory, in China. Okay. So that's the break point, if you like. So companies with less than 20 will continue to expand. Invest, so yeah. China, India, obviously a beneficiary of that risk that I'm mm -hmm. mentioning, but mm -hmm. also growth. It's the most populous yep. country in the, in the world. In the world. Uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, the Philippines, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia. What I would call New Asia mm. offers us tremendous opportunities, I think, for global businesses. And then the area that I haven't mentioned is Europe. And I think um, the prognostication for Europe is not great. Mm. I think France, Germany, Italy, and Spain, and the UK the clients I speak to are almost unanimous in looking at that region from a cost point of view. They very rarely look at it, if ever, from a revenue, revenue. point of view. Mm. So that brings me to the second point. The first point is geographical fragmentation yep. and focus. And the second thing is in a world where there will be slower growth, where there will be more inflation and higher interest rates, efficiency is really important. So AI-driven technology, mm. not just AI, quantum computing, cloud computing, blockchain. Yep. I'm not so keen on crypto, but yep. certainly blockchain should remove a lot of the frictions mm. in supply chains and a lot of opportunities. Those technologies are going to become really important in driving efficiency uh, in the world. So those two things, sure. geographical fragmentation and technological development stimulated by these these latest technological sure. developments. You mentioned uh, a, a few bit of uh, interesting markets within Asia. Are there any plans because of our of a proximity to the region well, to establish something? Yeah, we have a very good business in Shanghai, and I'd like to expand in China. We, we should be bigger in China. We should be bigger in other Asian markets too. We're currently about 70% in North and South America, about 20% in EMEA and 10% in Asia Pacific. I'd like to see the balance pretty quickly brought to sort of 60, 20, 20, mm. keeping EMEA, we should be bigger in EMEA too, mm. but the growth opportunities in Asia, the growth opportunities in South exactly. America, Excellent. the growth opportunities in the Middle East, I think those are the three primary areas, mean that that's where I think naturally the expansion will come apart from what you might do in in organic sure. from a functional point of view we're about 60 percent digital advertising content Creative, yeah. about 30 percent data and analytics and 10 percent technology services and probably 50 25 25 would probably be the the right balance for that too so we have you know but, but the growth is going to drive us that way because the technology services growth is going to be quite significant driven by AI and the yeah. technologies I mentioned before. So Martin, you first appeared in the South China Morning Post in 1986. Was I live then? Gosh, it's a long, <laughs> long time ago. Yeah, you certainly are and very well today as well. <laughs> uh, in, a, in an article entitled, Changing Consumer Habits Prompt a New Marketing Approach. Yeah. Now, looking back at your, your career and yeah. you know, a very illustrious career, um, what advice would you give any aspiring entrepreneurs or business leaders specifically in the marketing field? Learn Chinese. I think I would learn Spanish as well, actually. I think that that would be the, um, 
the advice I would give. Mm. I think clients have become very short term in their thinking. I mm. mean, for two principal reasons. The first is the rise of private equity, yeah. whose hold periods are sure four or five years. And in fact, when you speak to a private equity man or woman, they say, what's the exit before they talk about the entry? So that's one thing that's happening. And then in the listed sector, of course, you have CEOs who face institutional investors mm. every quarter. And it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a pretty pernicious problem in the UK because pension funds, yeah. um, the proportion of their portfolios held in equity has shrunk from about 49% to about 2%. Mm. And in fact, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, recently said, encourage companies that are speech in the mansion house to invest even more in private equity, which filled me with a little bit of horror because it's the listed sector where we need to get institutions Correct. to focus on growth. Correct. Because the dominant forces in the world economy, you know, the US at 28 trillion and China at 18 out of a total of 100, is the US and China. Right. And when we talk about AI, for example, mm. the two countries that get mentioned most in the context of development are the US and China. China. Those will be the leaders. Mm. The interesting thing also about it is, you know, I always describe it as being two buckets. Mm. Really. There's the geographical bucket and the technological bucket. And those two forces or sets of forces drive how you think about the world and how you develop your business in that world. And I think that, that, that still holds true. Your story actually began in 1975 and you became the CFO of Saatchi's. Yes. And a, t a decade later in 1985, you bought a small little company called uh, Wire Plastic and Products PLC, yes. as we all know today as WPP. Um, and those were the heydays of splashy TVCs, really expensive shoes yeah. and, you know, Super Bowl ads and millions yeah. of dollars and all that. Um, you know, do you see the second heyday coming for advertising and where do you see technology yeah. And AI in particular, we've well, touched on. What, you know, what's there, that? There, we, we operate in three addressable markets, the global media market, marketing services, and technology services. The global media market is about 950 uh, billion, is mm -hmm. almost a, yeah. a trillion. Um, marketing services probably about 500 billion. And tech services, the varying figures, but probably 300 billion, 400 billion. Uh, if I just take global media, for example, that's nine, probably this year, about 950. Mm -hmm. Of that, 650 is digital. Yeah. Of that, Google this year in terms of ad revenues, these are ad revenues sure. figures, Tough. will probably be about 220, 225. Mm -hmm. uh, Meta, Facebook, yeah. Instagram will be about 125, so that's 350. And Amazon will be 50, it's 400. So 400 out of the 650. Alibaba and Tencent, we don't have a detailed figures. ByteDance probably is about yeah. 90 billion mm -hmm. versus 60 Tough, billion. Yeah. X China, TikTok outside China, as best as we can figure out, is probably about 14 billion versus 10. Mm -hmm. So orders of magnitude, you can see yeah. where the dominant forces are. It's the three Western platforms mm. and the three, three Eastern, Eastern platforms. Those are, that's the game, yeah. right? Uh, by the way, AI, quantum computing, and the cost of AI and the cost of developing LLMs, yeah. language models, mm -hmm. are so huge that those companies will probably, in my view, become even more powerful, right? You know, Apple is back at three trillion. Mm -hmm. uh, if you equate market cap to country, that's almost as big as Germany, bigger than the UK, bigger than probably in France, mm. or around the same size as France, bigger than Italy uh, or Spain. So we are talking about companies that are huge. Now, Apple and Microsoft will play a role. Put it just in perspective, Snap's about five and a half, Pinterest about four, and Twitter was five. It's gone to two and a half, maybe even lower. So it's a very concentrated business. And the, the point of going through those numbers is to demonstrate how important those big platforms are. Yeah. Um, you know, Jack Maher at Alibaba used to say that Alibaba was the engine of the entrepreneur. Yeah. Same thing applies actually to big platforms. Yeah. The, the reason why those companies didn't go belly up in COVID was because they had access to those platforms. Correct. A, a feature that I think but all the platforms should emphasize. Mm. They should emphasize they are the engine of growth because 60 to 70% of Alphabet, of Meta, especially, and even maybe more of Amazon's ad revenues come from small and medium-sized businesses. So that's the structure. Digital is 65% 
of that media market. Mm. It'll be 75 percent, 70 to 75 percent by 2025. It's growing in fast. The really interesting thing about 2023 <coughs> is despite the fact that the tech companies, not all of them, have reduced their advertising and marketing spends, their ad revenues it's are up. up. <laughs> uh, ad revenues probably for the platforms this year will be up about 10 percent. For linear TV, it's, you know, Discovery Warner was down 14 percent in Q3. Mm. And I think on average, they're probably down about 8, 9 or 10 percent for the first nine months of this year. And even if you had sports, you know, like Fox and yep. Disney have sports to buttress. Live sport is mm. very powerful from an advertising point of view. Yes. Linear ad revenues were still, even for the sports driven channels, if you like, or emphasis, em emphasize sports channels, probably down two, three, four percent. That gap between the growth of the digital platforms and the decline of the linear platforms, you know, you see it with uh, Disney mm. and with Bob Iger, you know, putting yep. ABC on the block, yep. if yeah. you like, or certainly and ESPN talking about a absolutely. possible partnership. A absolutely. All this means. That, that, that this year, the, the, the dichotomy, the, the disparity between the two is huge. You're talking about up 10 versus, let's say, down 10. So there's a, a 20 point difference mm. between the two. We haven't seen mm. that. What's interesting about this year is where did that growth come to for the platforms? It came from the packaged goods companies. Correct. Because companies like Procter, Unilever, Pepsi, Coca Cola, Mondelez, whatever, were able to price up. As inflation, if inflation right. was up 10 to 15 percent, I remember in Q2 of yeah. this year, Pepsi was up 15 percent in sales. Right. Their ad budgets go up in line because they fix their advertising as a proportion right. of sales and they keep the proportion and they want to build build their brands. That money seems to have gone into the digital platforms. And we also see coming back to the short term point, we also see companies really focused on trying to get short term growth through performance, activation, mm. experiential stuff. And the platforms have better justifications in terms of research and data to justify the spending. What, what is your point of view about you know, brand versus performance? I mean, this perpetual debate. The fact is the world has got shorter mm. in terms of time frame, whether it be private equity driven or being listed company driven, or the pace of technological change is so powerful. I mean, you mm. see it with Gen Zers or younger generations yeah. than mine, they do tend to flip from flower to flower, right. build things and sell them. That might be the best strategy. So Martin, I want to ask you about uh, global brands and how they usually do sure. out here in Asia. A lot of times we see that they aren't naturally very successful. And as you talked about, you know, how the rise of China and, you know, technology and, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, Chinese companies. Uh, in particular, for example, in Hong Kong, we see a lot of Chinese EVs. Mm -hmm. Electric vehicles are um, making a play and been mm -hmm. relatively successful. Uh, what would be your advice to global brands heading into Asia and um, and into 2024. Okay, so well, let's talk about it both ways. So global brands coming into Asia and, and Chinese brands going up. I think post COVID, um, global brands have been hesitant to come fully back in, just clients were even more cautious. They took a long time to agree their budgets, principally because, you know, interest rates yeah, were, were down here and people thought they were going to rise. I think foreign companies in China have tended to be a bit hesitant, particularly those with big market positions because of the security risk. The opposite is true of Chinese. I think the Chinese companies have grasped the opportunity much more aggressively. And you see this without bound Chinese on EVs. Yep. You see it with Tema and Shine. Shine yep. I mean, Tema, yep. you know, Shine went from 3 billion to 25 billion in terms of sales in one year. I mean, it's incredible. The simple fact is that Chinese companies, and I was reading a really interesting article actually on China's uh, increasing output in shipbuilding, an industry where China had not been um, very aggressive, but with real labor rates mm. having declined in China, with deflation being the issue in China rather mm -hmm. than inflation, that China competitively has got a much bit better, bigger position in general shipping construction and liquid na na natural gas uh, and an LNG shipping, mm. where, where they traditionally did not have it. So 
they are making inroads from an export point of view, EVs being another good mm, example. Mm. I mean, there are a huge number of EV companies. Yep. They can't all survive. Many of them have not survived to date. I mean, somebody right. showed me a list, a slide of all the EV brands from, I don't know, about four or five years ago, and then crossed off the Each ones one that have it. failed. <laughs> uh, there are still 40, 50, whatever it is, who are still yeah. succeeding. But price competition is intense. Right. You remember we saw in mainland China, um, Tesla and others tried to get together to keep prices yeah. higher and the government intervened. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big issue, the, the nature of the competition. But there is a clear demarcation that we see currently may not last, mm. where foreign multinationals would be more hesitant mm. in China, and Chinese brands have been more aggressive. Now, we have to see how Chinese companies manage global expansion. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't, if I was them, you know, first of all, I'd, sat, I, I'd, I'd satisfy myself in the domestic market. But on the assumption that they had the right position in the, in the domestic market, you go abroad. I wouldn't go for the bigger markets. I mm. would go to where the competition was a little bit less severe mm -hmm. and pick off. And with the shifting power balances that we're starting to see in the world, global north versus global south, yeah. the rise of other, uh, other economies on a, a global stage, much to America's dislike, but, but um, or certainly Republican Americans <laughs> dislike, um, the simple fact is America is going to have to share power, I think, sure. over the coming years as other countries become bigger forces, both politically and economically. How do you see the role of a traditional news organization as SEMP? You know, I personally think AI will reduce the demand for labor on a sure. net basis. Yep. We'll have to see how it plays sure. out. So I mean, in our industry, we are seeing, starting to see the impact of AI. And some of it's positive and some of it's negative. Yeah, with, I mean, the, with the stuff creative with, and content. Well, v visualization and copywriting, you know, where we're get, seeing a very significant product, productivity, productivity increases, we will have to share with clients. Yep. You know, if it takes us three hours instead of 30 hours, hyper personalization, being able to personalize campaigns. Correct. You know, we were talking actually with the client today about the fact that uh, one client that we know wants to have individual ads for every single consumer in China. So, wow. well, you know, 1.2 billion, which is, <laughs> which is theoretically possible with AI, that you could tailor sure. using AI. And in fact, we've got some case studies already. That's at that, scale. That, that's at scale, at huge scale. Yep. Third area, media planning and buying. You know, it can be reduced on the digital side, certainly to an algorithm. Mm. So networks of 10,000 or 15,000 people who do things on this semi-automated or manual way are going to go. Mm. Then there's general efficiency. So for example, we have a, a joint venture with, um, with the, the exclusive integration partner with NVIDIA, uh, with AWS and Adobe for outside broadcasting. So you do an outside broadcast, you need a truck, it costs you $7 million, you have to amortize it over five years, let's say it's a 1.2 million a year. We can produce a cloud-based AI solution for 100,000. So it's a 90% wow. cost reduction, so efficiency. And then the fifth area, which I think is the really interesting thing and has huge implications for you, is the, what I call the democratization of knowledge. Mm. That ev everybody here, SCMP, yes. uh, or at uh, S4, you know, Media Monks, yeah. eight and a half thousand people. You know, we have 700 people who work on Google mm. around the world. If we can, you know, subject to privacy and subject yeah. to security and all that sort of thing, that we, that we can give instant access to knowledge about that piece of business, mm. that's a huge opportunity. Um, because the biggest problem is, I'm sure it doesn't happen here, but is the siloed Correct. verticals inside companies. I mean, it's the biggest problem in clients, it's sure. the biggest problem in agencies. Yeah. They don't communicate the, the exactly. net metric, what the end goal is. So the exactly. planner is doing something and the clients have an expectation this is performance base or yeah, what and, the outcome and, and is. And then, you know, political differences or what I call vertical differences, because companies yeah. are organized vertically. They should be organized horizontally, mm. in my view. And what I'd like to do is create human bots, if you like, <laughs> where they instantly know what people inside the company know about clients. So, Martin, I would like to ask you, um, 
your 2023 in one word? Tough, I think. 2020 was tough. I mean, geopolitical issues um, mean that it's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, so I think it's, it's been a, a difficult year. Clients, CEOs exude confidence when you actually talk to people inside the business because of these big challenges, climate change and everything else. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're, they're bemused by some of the challenges and it tends to make them very cautious. And 2024, I would say the same. I, I think we, we have to wait until the US election is out of the way. And that might create its own issues mm -hmm. because, you know, I would say Depending on Trump's, your side. <laughs> Trump's chances probably are 30, 40 percent probability that he'll get re-elected. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for the world? Uh, so we may see a little bit of more lift next year from, right. from that. But the real world, I think, will continue to be cautious. So it's tough and tough. Terrell. Super cautious and a little bit less cautious. <laughs> Sir Ryan Sorrell, thank, thank you very you. much for Thanks, coming Kevin. in. And it's great Thanks. to talk to you. Very good. Thank Appreciate you very much. No, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.